brought the wrong. I thought I brought the garlic, and it's not the garlic. Oh, ranch. It's not ranch, but it's like a. I think it's like a yogurt. Let's go downstairs. It's like a dollar. I know, but I don't like that as much. I think if you go back into like the actual PowerPoint, you should be able to play it from there. And then it should be able to share on Zoom. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close it and I'll go back in and see if I can get it. Sorry for all the delay. It's okay, this technology is a, it's a love-hate relationship. <laughs> It's frustrating to be sure. Zoom recording. Okay. I think we can go ahead and start then. So. And if you want, you can give him remote control to like to a remote access and he should be able to advance the slides if you want. Ooh. Fancy. Except there's now three three filled rosters that I see on this. Oh, okay, never mind. It's okay. I'll just do it for <laughs> you. I'll just All tell right. me when to advance. No, that's fine. That's fine. All right. So sorry about that, guys. I really apologize for the delay. Um, obviously, I'll try to keep this timely. I know everybody's got things to do, and there's other lectures to go on. So, Brady, you can go ahead and skip ahead to the third slide. Uh, I have no disclosures, except I'm really happy it's 2021 and uh, hopefully it'll be a good year. So this is kind of the outline of what we'll discuss, you know, briefly some things I might skip over a little bit. Uh, I have included quite a bit of references for your review. So whatever I'm unable to really cover, um, please do utilize this power present presentation for your own education and learning and to kind of just review the references as much as possible. And hopefully we can get through as much as um, we're able to. Uh, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So uh, in terms of status epilepticus, and what I think really the major thing I want everybody to take away here, uh, especially since we're, we've got a lot of non-neurologists in the uh, group, is that for, for treating seizures and especially for treating status epilepticus, it is classified as a neurological emergency. So you know when we think about stroke or we think about you know ICH or subarachnoid, uh, we always seem to have our antennas up really high and are very uh, alert to the, you know, consequences and complications that come with it. But I think sometimes when treating seizures, we're a little bit maybe uh, benign or not as quick to react. Um, and so the reason why it's important to remember that is because the longer we allow patients to seize, the worse their outcomes and mortality tend to be. So earlier treatment and management is always more efficacious um, in general. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Should just be one more click. So to kind of define things so that we all understand, uh, I wanted to kind of really quickly review what the differences and kind of definitions are of seizures versus status. So at the top you see something that looks like a seizure where you have a very high amplitude rhythmic kind of fast wave, um, you know, discharge versus the bottom where you see kind of a quantitative, um, you know, imaging of, you know, seizure and almost every single, you know, spike that you see is somewhat of a, you know, uh, pattern for seizures. So this patient is obviously in status because they're having recurrent seizures that are occurring over a period of time. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So what is a seizure? Uh, it's a transient occurrence of obviously signs clinically or symptoms clinically or lack thereof, depending on if it's just a non-convulsive event um, where they have excessive uh, brainwave activity that um, occurs in varying regions of the brain. It can occur from one area and it can occur um, from both hemispheres or it can occur from one area and spread obviously to adjacent regions and then occur in both hemispheres, which is kind of what you see here at the start um, on the left side. And as it progressively worsens, you know, you see it become much more fast, much more rhythmic. And so this is just kind of a buildup of a convulsive, you know, seizure event. 
And on the far right side of the uh, image, you kind of see this very high, you know, sharp wave activity. So likely this patient is developing a convulsive, you know, uh, seizure event and going into that full generalized kind of tonic-clonic uh, seizure activity that we uh, tend to think of more frequently. Um, okay, go ahead. So to define seizures, you know, we as neurologists tend to define them either as focal or generalized. There was kind of a major shift in paradigm um, based on the International League Against Epilepsy, uh, which everyone kind of makes fun of because it tends to be like, you know, the Avengers or the Justice League of, you know, seizure management. But we look at it and we see that, you know, with focal seizures, they usually begin in one specific localized area of the brain. And then the major criteria for that uh, really depend on whether or not they have uh, preserved consciousness or awareness. And usually, you know, we define that as either a simple or a complex focal seizure event. People in the past used to say partial, you know, versus generalized. So now we say focal um, as more of kind of a, you know, specific marker. Um, and usually this is what occurs in the context of when we define like localization related epilepsy. Um, probably the easiest way to delineate that is somebody who's had a stroke and the left hemisphere of the brain, and then they develop seizures um, from that side of the brain. And so they'd be described as having a localization related epilepsy um, because they have recurrent seizure events and are therefore at higher risk for further seizure events, which is essentially the definition of epilepsy. When we talk about generalized, we talk about it occurring within both hemispheres of the brain. Um, and this is more of your tonic-clonic seizures you know, we all kind of heard of the absence seizures that occur in children, um, myoclonic seizure events that occur most of the time in like, you know, uh, post uh, noxic uh, brain injuries or cardiac arrests. Um, you can have tonic or even atonic seizures and then clonic seizures where there's essentially just, you know, um, stiffening or relaxing alone without the kind of, you know, flexion extension posturing that occurs with most tonic clonic seizure events in general. Okay. So with status, um, previously, you know, the definition of status was um, someone who had a, either seizure activity continuously for five minutes or had two seizure events um, back to back without a return to baseline. The problem with that was there was a lot of ambiguity in terms of how we were defining how long it took for someone to come back to baseline, what that looked like, and then, you know, when do we define whether or not they um, are, you know, actually still having continuous seizure activity because clinically they aren't hooked up to the EEG. We don't know if they're seizing when we see them in the ER or initially on the floor. Um, so more recently, um, the uh, ILAE has really kind of looked at and especially um, within the neurocritical care world of more like time points. So usually for five minutes, we're looking at you know generalized activity. For 10 minutes, we're looking at focal activity. And usually that's time or one or like the first point in time um, and then the second point in time is at 30 minutes in which long-term effects can occur from continuous seizure activity. So really, if anybody's having recurrent seizure activity for more than five to 10 minutes, they're classified as having, you know, essentially status epilepticus from that standpoint. Um, you know, there's still a lot of people who will still use the definition of having two recurrent seizures without a return to baseline. Um, there's still, you know, some uh, you know, neurologists that will follow that paradigm as well. But, you know, the more recent evidence and literature has looked at that because as we look at, you know, animal studies and more kind of, you know, pathologic based, you know, evidence, we see that there is a significant amount of neuronal injury that occurs the longer the time has um, progressed when seizure activity is occurring. And you can see at the bottom, the, you know, picture is essentially just a qualitative EEG um, map. And every time you see kind of a spike where there's some red and green is essentially a seizure event. And so you're seeing somebody who's having initially at the very top, you know, somewhat intermittent seizure events. And then as you kind of progress along, as you go to the bottom, you're seeing someone who's having more and more progressive seizure events. And so the reason why I wanted to include this, so you can kind of delineate and see that there are time delineations within, you know, status even of, you know, someone who's presenting initially having one seizure and then they return back to baseline and that's it versus someone who has a seizure, doesn't really return to baseline, but doesn't have another generalized event. They may have just, you know, prolonged ultimate status. And what we see a lot of times on the EG once we hook them up is this pattern where 
they were having recurrent intermittent seizure events that have become now more frequent and almost near consistent um, because they weren't treated early on. So you can go to the next slide. So this is just a table um, to kind of help reinforce that and delineate um, the timeframes. Um, I'll let you review it on their own, not much else, but again, it's just more of the, the uh, time to seizure event. So you can go ahead and go to the next one. So refractory status epilepticus, especially in the ICU, I think this is something we will see quite a bit more. You guys in the MICU and the SICU will see this obviously, um, when you have patients that have prior brain injuries or someone who has a traumatic brain injury, things like that. When we say refractory status epilepticus, what we're saying is essentially someone who's had seizure activity that continues after the administration of two antiepileptic therapies. And that can be including the first line treatment therapy like a benzodiazepine, and then a second line treatment therapy such as Keppra or you know, Dilantin or Depakote. Um, but once you reach you know, the second line therapy, if they still are having seizure activity, then at that point, they are classified as having refractory status epilepticus. And then you can see the timeframes there for the delineation between generalized and focal. Super refractory is when you kind of get to a tertiary line of uh, you know, medication. And in this sense, it could be the addition of a you know, second or third line um, you know, seizure medication. It could be the administration of an IV anesthetic drug agent, which is more commonly kind of you know, algorithm that's followed. Um, so if they are still having continuous seizure activity at this time, they're called to be in super refractory status epilepticus. This term itself is relatively newer. It came about within the last five to 10 years. Um, and so there's still light, a lot of research and a lot of um, evidence that is you know, not really known in terms of super refractory status epilepticus. Um, we've had a couple cases in the neuro ICU um, from that standpoint, but overall has not necessarily um, been something that's significantly common, but definitely occurs, you know, intermittently. Let me go to the next slide. So I'm not going to really go too much into the classifications. I think, um, you know, given the time frame, if I had more time, I could probably go over these more. But essentially, you know, the main things to know are delineating whether they are generalized or focal, and then within that, whether they're convulsive or non-convulsive. And if they've got generalized versus focal activity, because the type of semiology or seizure and pattern does somewhat predict or you know give somewhat of a prognosis in terms of how they will progress along the algorithm, um, you know, from seizure to status to refractory or even super refractory status epilepticus. Um, so you can go to the next one. So when we talk about you know, convulsive status, just to kind of briefly you know, review, we look at someone who's got generalized movements and essentially the way that I really like to think about it is someone who's got you know, an overlatter, you know, in this case, somewhat, uh, I guess, nice to see for today, uh, computer you know, malfunction or overdrive. And then eventually you, have, you get to the point where the computer is just not functioning well enough that you have to do a hard reboot. And so it essentially gets to the point where it burns out and then you stop seeing any kind of clinical seizure activity, and then you slowly start to see the brain waves recover, um, and the person begin to wake up. You know, so a lot of times, you know, we want to, you know, shut down um, the brain, or the brain shuts itself down, but then it has to reboot, you know, over a period of time. And that's usually what occurs with a generalized seizure state. You can't have focal features, but you know, obviously, there's quite a bit of systemic complications that occur, and you know, has a higher rate for. Um, mortality if not addressed or treated early. Obviously, there are some cases where people can have significant respiratory arrest or even cardiopulmonary arrest in the setting of seizure, um, depending on their underlying comorbidities. So obviously, it's pretty significant in that sense, but I think we've all kind of seen that and know. So we can go to the next one. So more, more prominently is something you know, that we see quite a bit um, in the neuro ICU as well as the medical ICU and the surgical ICU, which is non-convulsive status epilepticus. There's really no definitive criteria to delineate this. There are criteria somewhat for EEG patterns. I'm not really gonna go into the actual criteria that too much, cause that's not really for you guys to know. That's more for us as neurologists or even specifically the epileptologists to know. Um, but just know that, you know, when you look at a patient, if they've had a seizure convulsive um, in a sense, or they have prolonged you know, alteration in their mentation or their neurological exam, uh, 
the non-convulsive status epilepticus should be something that comes to your mind relatively significantly. If they have a lot of features um, that would explain their mentation, sepsis or fever, you know, or significant electrolyte abnormalities, that's, you know, something definitely to be addressed and noted. But even then, with lots of reviews and studies have shown that between 15 to 20 percent of all ICU patients at some point can develop non-convulsive status epilepticus. And so because of their mentation changes, you know, it's definitely important to keep this on the front for or the, you know, uh, forefront of your mind um, when kind of, you know, addressing these patients at the bedside, because even though they may have some under, you know, lying etiology that could, per, you know, potentially explain their mentation changes, I still think that it's something to be very mindful of because, you know, once you miss it, you know, and they continue to seize, you, you know, significantly set them up for higher rate of mortality, long-term, you know, comorbidities, and, you know, significant issues with trying to abort or stop the seizure activity. So we can go to the next one. So this is the table, um, kind of to, you know, restress that. There's different risk factors um, that can occur, obviously, for, um, you know, non-convulsive status epilepticus. And so these are things I'll let you guys review on your own. But, you know, know that there are, you know, quite a number of different things that do contribute to the development of non-convulsive status epilepticus um, with convulsive, you know, status epilepticus being uh, quite a, you know, high number of them. And then also cardiac arrest. A lot of times when we get our patients that go in cardiac arrest and then, you know, go through cooling, you know, we wait for them to kind of wake up. And, you know, a lot of times we don't see that, but there has been a lot of studies that have shown and looked at patients who have reemerged and somewhere between the range of 15 to 25% of them as they're reemerging from their, you know, therapeutic hypothermia can be in non-convulsive status. And so, you know, if you have someone who's delayed in their awakening or, you know, you're concerned about, I, I would favor definitely getting an EEG on them earlier to assess and make sure that they are not seizing rather than, you know, waiting around uh, because they have you know, obviously significant risk factors to, you know, develop anoxic brain injury and therefore neuro, neuronal injury and develop non-convulsive status. So we can go to the next one. So I'm going to kind of run through this part fast, just because this is not really the main uh, crux of the talk, just to kind of, you know, throw numbers at the, you know, situation. I think a lot of this is just to highlight the, you know, um, you know, reality that, you know, convulsive and non-convulsive status epilepticus is a lot more prominent than we think. And so, um, you know, you know, when we look at the numbers, even just 10% of hospitalized patients, not ICU patients, but just hospitalized patients um, can be in non-convulsive status. And the rate goes up obviously if they're in the ICU. So I think it's something that we need to definitely keep more at the forefront of our minds when addressing these patients. Um, and then in terms of the rates of those that progress to refractory or super refractory, um, those who are in, you know, status epilepticus, about 30 to 40% of them can progress to refractory uh, status epilepticus. And of those, you know, somewhere between 15 to 30% can actually go to super refractory status epilepticus in general. So, you know, it's one of those things, obviously, the earlier you catch it, you know, and you kind of really, you know, identify and treat it, the better their prognosis can be. But, you know, I think, again, it's more just to highlight the fact that this needs to be at the forefront when we are kind of addressing our patients at the bedside. Okay. This is just a table kind of to show the incidence and mortality of status that has, um, you know, occurred. This was a national database that was um, conducted from 1980 to 2010. And so essentially the incidence of, you know, status has actually increased about, I think it was 30 to 40%, uh, but the actual mortality rates uh, haven't actually decreased at all. If anything, they've kind of stayed the same or gone up a little bit. Can go to the next slide. And then this is just a table to kind of show, you know, convulsive status versus non-convulsive status um, in the sense of age. And so there is an, you know, part, or there is a significant trend of people that have an increasing age. There's usually a bimodal distribution. This is teenagers to adults since we deal with adults, but there is a pretty bimodal distribution where you know, younger than five years old will be at a higher risk for status. And then between five to, you know, 18 years old is, you know, where it kind of, you know, decreases and, you know, stays relatively low until you get the age of 50. And then at the age of 50, it tends to go up exponentially by decade. 
uh, with the highest being obviously in the more elderly and advanced populations, which is also true when you look at the data for non-convulsive status epilepticus versus convulsive. So um, the elderly populations are at much higher risk. In terms of the race, you know, we look at African Americans, they do have a higher risk um, than, you know, Caucasian or even Hispanic races. Um, there's actually more recent evidence that suggests that males and females in general are similar in their rates of status, um, whereas previously they were thought that males or females actually had a higher rate of status epilepticus, and that's not necessarily true more recently. Um, in terms of the actual mortality rate, that's about 15 to 20%, depending on which study you look at. Um, the more recent CDC and the uh, VA slash, you know, National Hospital Database guidelines, you know, show about 15% in general with the elderly populations being the ones that are at highest risk for death um, because of going to refractory status. Okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of just skip over these next couple slides because this is essentially just talking about the predictors and just, you know, the progression from status to refractory status. And we know that, you know, because the studies are not really, um, we don't have large meta-analyses and a lot of the data is still pretty limited within the last 10 or 15 years, you know, the incidence is a little bit lower, but at the same time, we know that there are significant predictors uh, for refractory status, which you can see there. Um, but we can go to the next slide. So the big thing that I wanted to point out here, which is, you know, something that we, um, they did a, a meta-analysis of um, the super refractory status epilepticus, you know, in terms of their hospital and mortality rate at out one year, those that had actually status epilepticus when they presented, about 22% of them had super refractory status epilepticus. And so the reason why I'm highlighting this is because this is something that is becoming more um, prominent. Obviously there's more, uh, you know, studies, more trials, more, you know, uh, evidence that's being, you know, put out about this, but, you know, I wouldn't, you know, put it past the next five or 10 years for us to really be able to identify more readily those who are not only in refractory status epilepticus, but those who are going to progress to super refractory status epilepticus, because a lot of times the outcomes are lower um, and the mortality rate is higher in super refractory status epilepticus. And so it may be depending on the age um, or the significant comorbidities, someone where we have to be a little bit more selective in who we offer advanced treatment therapies. And so we have to be just mindful and cognizant that there is a growing population that will develop status up or super refractory status epilepticus and, you know, how we manage them initially. And then kind of the long-term goals of CARES discussions become very important within those patient populations. So two divisions for etiologies, um, you know, I'm gonna kind of skip over the classifications and go more to the bottom. The primary etiologies that we see when we talk about status and even refractory or super refractory status epilepticus are usually CNS infectious processes, whether this is viral encephalitis like HSV or just, you know, aseptic, you know, enterovirus, you know, encephalitis or encephalitis. Uh, low EV levels in those who had uh, prior localization related epilepsy or seizures at baseline was also a predictor or an etiology. There is more evidence that's coming out about autoimmune phenomenon, this, uh, you know, phenomenon called NORS, which is new onset refractory status epilepticus is something that's kind of clinically defined as someone who does not have a baseline seizure history, but yet presents and has um, EEG findings of status epilepticus. And so a lot of times treatment with, you know, autoimmune therapies such as steroids or IVIG actually has been shown to be beneficial. But, you know, the more common and traditional thing is obviously to think of a viral, um, you know, etiology many times. Obviously, we're all concerned about someone who may have some form of bacterial meningitis um, or even perineoplastic. Um, more commonly, though, is the viral encephalitis that occurs when these patients have status epilepticus because the primary, the majority of them that have bacterial infections have more meningeal irritation, which puts them at risk for, you know, parenchymal irritation. But those that have viral symptoms usually have an invasion or significant neuronal injury to the actual parenchyma itself, which is what's causing them to have a higher risk for seizures and status epilepticus at that time. So we'll go to the next one. So I'm gonna skip over this slide. This is just kind of an acute versus chronic comparison. Um, I'll let you guys look at that on your own. 
And then the overall morbidity and factors that contribute are obviously like the etiology, the mental status impairment when they uh, kind of, you know, appear at our institution. And then obviously the longer the duration of the seizures, the higher the rate of mortality. Um, and this is kind of shown there was a study um, in 2012 that looked at, you know, retrospectively how quickly patients were treated. And if they're treated within 10 hours, their rate of mortality is about 10%. But if they were, you know, not treated for more than 20 hours, it went up to 85%. And the reason why that's important is a lot of times these patients that come in with strokes or they're found out at home with cardiac arrest, you know, and they're there for quite a prolonged period of time. By the time they come up to our units and, you know, are relatively assessed and, you know, appropriately triaged, many times they're going on five to 10 hours, maybe longer. And so we have to be obviously very cognizant that, you know, the longer they're there, the more lower our threshold should be to evaluate for underlying seizure activity to help kind of prevent any further progression. So we'll go to the next one. And again, I'll kind of let you guys review this one on your own. This is just um, a uh, trial that was done in 2015. It's called the STEP audit trial. It was a global uh, trial that looked at varying etiologies by country um, around the globe and then looked at the mortality rates that you know occurred. Obviously you can kind of see um, that there is some tie to the etiology itself. Um, the highest etiology obviously was kind of a cryptogenic where they weren't sure, but at the same time, you know, it had lower rate of mortality. Um, the highest, you know, rate of mortality was actually those who had anoxic brain injury. And some of that's somewhat of a self-fulfilling prophecy, but overall, um, I'll let you guys review that on your own uh, down the road. So real quickly, I just want to use this one slide to kind of highlight pathophysiology. When we talk about status, the biggest thing to know is that it is an excitotoxic state. There's a decrease in GABA and there's an increase in glutamate or exo, you know, excitotoxicity. And we see the GABA receptors that are usually on the outside of the brain, like on the left of the slide, go to the inside. And those that are the NMDA receptors uh, tend to migrate to the outside and you see a reversal of good and bad. And so seizures potentiate seizures. So as seizures continue, the receptors that you would need to help actually uh, abort or see seizure activity are less readily available for utilization. And the actual receptors that would potentiate seizure activity become more, much more readily available and prominent on cellular surfaces. So that somewhat has driven a lot of the more recent research in terms of IV anesthetic drug agents and you know, pharmacotherapies in terms of how we treat seizure activity because of these phenomena. But know that essentially seizure is a excitotoxic state and the longer it lasts, the more refractory it becomes because there is a reversal of normal cellular and metabolic changes that occur uh, at baseline. So I'm going to skip over this slide um, because essentially this is just discussing kind of inflammation and what occurs secondarily to what we just discussed. So we kind of skip over this. And then again, kind of what I was describing about the excitotoxic state, you know, obviously secondarily, you see mitochondrial dysfunction, necrosis, apoptosis, varying neuro uh, inhibitory substances that decrease and excitatory substances that increase. Um, so we can go to the next slide. And then this is just kind of to help show, you know, green's good, red's bad. You know, we have this kind of progression of what occurs. And so someone who is developing a very resistant form of seizure, you know, obviously has a loss of homeostatic mechanisms. And so the earlier the treatment, the better, um, you know, the predictive value to abort the, you know, underlying seizure event. Okay. Uh, so I'll skip over this one as well. Uh, essentially, it's just metabolic chaos. I don't know if anybody likes M&Ms or Skittles. I don't really like either together, but that's essentially what it looks like when you are trying to treat someone in status. So evaluation and management, kind of go ahead. So I want to skip over this because essentially what I tried to do, this is based off of the neurocritical care uh, paper from 2012, which is very good in terms of the actual time and action in terms of how we want to do it. A lot of this is more for emergency medicine physicians, or even if you're on the floor. So I'm gonna kind of skip over this because for us, most of the time, our patients that are in the ICU, they already have vital signs at the bedside. They already have IV access. A lot of them are already intubated or on some sort of presser support. So it's not really attentive for us to do that. But the goal of all this is to abort seizure activity. 
when we give medications, and this is somewhat of a board question uh, for anybody that's getting ready, you know, this, this spring or summer to take the boards, you know, the initial emergent treatment for any of these patients is going to be uh, a benzo, lorazepam 0.1 milligrams per kilogram, uh, or diazepam 0.15 to 2 milligrams per kilogram are, you know, uh, the kind of, you know, standard and recommended amounts. If they don't have IV access, or you think the IV is infiltrated, you can always give IM, you know, midazolam or versed 10 milligrams. Um, and then obviously within the next five to 10 minutes, you know, we're looking at, you know, assessing them at the bedside, making sure that they're becoming more responsive. And if there is clinical consideration for further seizure activity, then you can load them with a secondary agent such as Dilantin or Keppra. Um, and so a lot of times I think people think we want to do all these things and get all these studies, let's send them for a head CT. The, the primary you know, purpose of treating someone who has seizures and has status is to treat the seizures. You know, obviously, if you have high concerns if someone has a significant liver failure, they have a coagulopathy, you know, you're worried that they may be bleeding, then you know, yes, obviously imaging is extremely important, but if they're still seizing or their clinical examination has not really improved, then you know, while you're sending them for the head CT, you should be treating them. Um, and also considering hooking them up for EEG to better assess their, you know, mentation and neurological examination to see if they have any underlying seizure activity. So we go to the next slide. And then this is just kind of a continuation of that, which I'll get into in a little bit. So the use of continuous EEG monitoring, I'm going to kind of skip over this. It's pretty straightforward in terms of when we want to do continuous EEG monitoring. Anyone who's had a clinical seizure or is not returning to baseline, you know, or is in a comatose state, such as post cardiac arrest patients, should be monitored, you know, because you know your clinical examination is good from a neurological standpoint, but it's not necessarily always going to give you all the information that you need. So a low threshold of suspicion uh, to kind of you know really assess them, and a lot of times even just getting a routine EEG for 30 minutes, and if you see something on there, the epileptologist sees something on there that would be concerning. For them to progress in a status, then you know you can just have an honest discussion and say, you know, I'm worried about this patient. They may be in non-convulsive status. What are your thoughts? And then a lot of times they can guide you on whether they would want to keep them hooked up for a full 12 to 24 hours and further assess them for underlying seizure activity. So go ahead. Uh, so this is just the European uh, Critical Care Society uh, back in 2013 that you know made recommendations. So I'll let you guys review that on your own. And then this is just kind of our, you know, journal from clinical neurophysiology from 2015 that essentially re kind of reaffirmed what they said back in 2013. And again, this is for critically ill and ICU patients that we're looking at the use of continuous EEG monitoring. So go ahead. Uh, so again, this is kind of just reaffirming that from a table form from the, you know, 2013 study. The only thing that I'll uh, underline again, most of the subarachnoid hemorrhages come to our unit in the neuro ICU. But you know, a lot of times, especially for TBIs, um, which is a little bit different because there's not a lot of studies that you know directly look to TBI with vasospasm and EEG. But at the same time, if you are concerned for vasospasm or some form of delayed cerebral ischemia, you can always use a non-invasive monitor such as EEG to assess for regional or localized, uh, you know, uh, slowing or brainwave patterns to assess for ischemia and possible vasospasm within those regions, along with TCDs and other markers as well. Uh, and this is just a table to show uh, on the um, uh, on the two axes. You have you know the percentage of patients that were captured with continuous EEG monitoring, the time that it took. If you can see pretty clearly, within one hour, about half of the patients in this study were detected to have you know some form of seizure activity. Um, you know, and so it progressively increased. Obviously, the longer they were hooked up. So a lot of times even just 24 hours of monitoring, it's going to get you almost 90%, you know, efficacy. And so a lot of times I think we want to keep these patients on for days and days. That's not necessarily the case unless they are in status and need to be treated. Uh, but at the same time, it's important to know that the earlier you hook them up, the quicker you can assess for whether there is underlying seizure activity and further direct kind of critical care management moving forward. So kind of real the crux of the talk, and since you know I've only got a few minutes, I'm going to go through this pretty quick. You can skip to the next slide. Uh, and actually go ahead and skip to the next slide. So the main things to take away from the lecture are this, this slide and a couple of the slides at the end. 
So one of my mentors, Dr. Zilgit, who's now at Beaumont, um, and then Dr. Borales, you know, were pretty adamant in terms of how they treated and managed seizure activity. I think these both are good algorithms. Um, and so I would definitely encourage you guys to kind of keep this and use this uh, for your own kind of clinical practice. Um, you know, most of the time, this is how progression will go. And so the big thing that I'll bring up in a second is more so you see underneath each one is the loading dose. And so it's important that you see that because when we treat seizures, a lot of the times we give loading doses for a reason because we want them to get at a therapeutic drug level early and quickly to help abort the seizure activity. And so obviously this is kind of a nice progression of how you would go and treat from a drug classification standpoint, but it's also important to make sure that you're looking at the specific dosage of the medication that you're giving. So you can go to the next slide. So I'm gonna kind of skip over this because a lot of this is just literature jargon to comparisons of you know, medications that you know, we've studied for convulsive and non-convulsive. And so um, this trial was essentially just discussing about you know, the utilization of benzodiazepines with lorazepam um, versus phenobarbital uh, diazepam and dilantin. And so this is more just kind of um, the treatment of generalized convulsive status which showed that benzodiazepines you know, are no more efficacious, but are still somewhat effective um, to be utilized. And then this was kind of followed up with a kind of, you know, landmark trial uh, called the RAMPAR trial, which looked at IM versus IV therapy for pre-hospital status epilepticus and showed that, you know, IM versus was as effective as IV, you know, or as a PAM. And so even in the hospital kind of, you know, we are talking about pre-hospital, but at the same time to be extrapolated, if you're in the ICU, you don't have great IV access, or you know there's kind of a you know shortage of you know medication on the floor. You know I am versus is a, a suitable alternative, you know first line option as well. So when looking at the seizure medications, you know the highest efficacy is usually attributed to the medications of Depakote, Keppra, and Phenobarb. Um, you know obviously there's only really one. Uh, which I'll go through in a second, you know, prospective randomized clinical trial that's compared varying uh, seizure medication therapies. Um, but, you know, right now there's not a ton of evidence that says one is superior to the other. So again, when you're going through the treatment algorithm, you can take it with a grain of salt because it's not like, you know, you say this is the second line agent that's the best agent. Um, there are variations of everything um, that can occur. So we can skip to the next slide. Uh, we can go ahead and go to the next slide actually because there's a couple of slides here. Um, you can go to the next slide. So essentially this study was, you know, a retrospective meta-analysis that looked at, you know, varying medication failures. Obviously when you're in the ED or the ICU, everybody says give Keppra, Keppra is great. There's not a lot of risk factors or adverse effects, but you know, if you look at it, Keppra is actually not the most efficacious, at least retrospectively. Um, Depakote um, and Phenobarb are actually more efficacious than Keppra. A lot of the times, obviously, people want to avoid further risk and harm, and so they go with Keppra because it's a little bit safer. But I would say, you know, you need to be careful because, you know, again, a lot of it really involves the loading of the medication therapy um, because a lot of times people will underdose Keppra, think that they're treating their patient appropriately when they really actually are not. So you can skip the next slide. And that's, uh, sorry, go back one slide. So that's what this study was for. It's, you know, a study that just came out. All the neurologists in the world were super excited. We finally had a randomized clinical trial comparing three, you know, you know well-established uh, seizure medications in Keppra, Depakote, and Dilantin. And lo and behold, none of them actually were superior to either one. So um, there was really no statistical difference in ICU mission, ICU or hospital length of stay, or even overall, you know, clinical outcome. Uh, there was maybe a trend or a correlation to show that, um, you know, there may be a slight, you know, bump with, you know, uh, aborting seizure activity using Depakote, but really in all honesty, they were about the same. And so again, it becomes the risk benefit management and how you, you know, prefer to treat based on your comfortability with the medications. So this is kind of a nice table for you guys to review on your own. Click one more, Brady. So the big thing I'm just wanting to point out here is when we talk about management of status epilepticus and then going back to that treatment algorithm, the most important thing to take away is to please, please, please 
work on trying to load based on a weight-based dose and not just say, oh, I'm going to give one gram or I'm going to give two grams. If you have someone that's 120 kilos, two grams, even one gram, it will not touch them um, if you're using something like Keppra. So we really want to try to avoid, you know, uh, using wimpy loading medication doses and try being more efficacious. You know, Dilantin even itself, 20 is the max. A lot of times people will load with 10 because that's kind of the initial loading dose if they're concerned. Again, a lot of this depends on what they're coming in with as a comorbidity. If they have significant underlying cardiovascular history, if they have underlying significant, you know, liver dysfunction, um, it, you know, varies in terms of the medications you want to use. But even within, then there's still, you know, optimal parameters of how much you can load and need to load. But I think just saying, I'm going to give them, you know, a, a gram of Keppra or I'm going to give them 500 of Dilantin, you know, is not really how to appropriately treat status. Giving loading doses is the actual clinical based application for when we want to manage these patients. So you can click. So that's just, you know, Rob Schneider versus John Cena. Let's get hefty and not be wimpy. So that's just kind of review there. And then, you know, the treatment algorithm again, so we can kind of click forward. So uh, to kind of go through this a little bit quickly, as we discussed before, the progression of status obviously depends on the cellular and neuronal uh, components that occur, um, you know, on a microscopic, you know, level. And so as me metabolic and underlying, you know, intracellular and extracellular physiology changes, patients become more and more refractory to seizure medications. Um, there was one study that looked at variant treatment therapies. And when you started with the first line therapy, they found that, you know, a lot of times seizures could be aborted within 40 to 50%. But by the time you got to the third level or the tertiary medication therapy in this study, it was down to 7% of patients actually being able to abort and control their seizure activity. And so the further and longer these patients seize, the less likely it is that you're going to really be able to significantly keep them from continuously seizing without having to do advanced um, measures. And we've kind of already discussed the definitions of refractory and super refractory. A lot of the times, if you have patients that are developing refractory or super refractory, you've obviously called neurology or you've probably asked if they need to be transferred over to our unit. Um, but it is significant to really look at um, you know, what they're being treated with and really know um, whether or not they are someone who would be a candidate. A lot of times patients that are, you know, significantly advanced with multiple comorbidities that are advanced in age and are now in super refractory status, their outcomes are going to be pretty low and very poor. And so, you know, one of the reasons why I mentioned that is because, you know, there's really um, not a lot of data from a super refractory standpoint, but we do know that, you know, the longer they seize, the less likely they are to not only regain any kind of Meaning, meaningful neurological recovery, but also furthermore, have a significant risk in mortality. And so before really going down a pathway of wanting to treat with a IV anesthetic or a significant advanced therapy, it is important to really assess the situation and have goals of care discussions with the family members to make sure that everyone's on the same page of where things are going to go moving forward. So using uh, IV anesthetic agents has become the treatment of choice for, um, you know, essentially uh, refractory and super refractory status. Um, usually by the time you initiate the treatment, um, they're probably well within 10 to 15 hours. Um, but a lot of times once we treat them, we usually maintain the treatment for at least 24, if not 48 hours, depending on what the EEG shows. The main agents we usually use in our unit are propofol, Versed, pentobarb, and ketamine. Um, you know, I'm not going to go through the advanced alternative therapies. That's a little bit out of the scope, but they can include like surgical resection or transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, things like that. So that's not really for you guys, um, but are alternative options to be considered in certain select cases. And then here's another chart to kind of help. And again, I want to stress the loading doses, right? You know, so if we're giving these medications, you know, if someone weighs 100 kilos and we want to do something like, you know, Versed, giving them, you know, essentially a two or four milligram load may not necessarily be what is beneficial for them from that standpoint. You know, a lot of times we need to make sure that we're optimally treating our patients to get them in a, you know, really suppressed state. And obviously by this time, if you're initiating these therapies, these patients should be on continuous CEG monitoring without a doubt. And so that's kind of the usual thing. 
Theopental is there, but is rarely used here in the US. Um, I've actually never seen it used. We've used Pentobar, but I've never used Theopento or Thiopental myself. Um, uh, so uh, it's usually not something we do. And in terms of you know inhaled anesthetics like isoflurane, um, I've not used those. We don't typically use those at this institution. Um, there's limited evidence in them, but there has been some more recent trend to exploring that as an alternative possibly. Uh, so I'll let you guys review this chart on your own. This is just kind of a pros and cons for each one. Uh, so we can skip the next slide. The one thing I wanted to bring up here though is that the, the general principle to take away from IV anesthetic agents is that, you know, pentobarb or any kind of barbitol uh, or barbiturate medication is going to be significantly effective in seizure suppression as well as background EEG suppression. But the higher the dose you are of any anesthetic agent, to you know, essentially suppress seizure activity, the more likely you are to encounter significant adverse you know, related effects, hypotension being the most common, uh, Versed has a higher rate of withdrawal seizures um, than any of the other medications actually. So again, that initial loading dose is extremely important um, when looking at you know, your uh, effectiveness for therapies. And then in all of them, there's a 2014 study in neurology that showed um, that IV anesthetic drug agents themselves are associated with you know, an increased mortality rate. And we don't necessarily know if that's because, uh, we don't think that it's because of the actual anesthetic drugs themselves, but more of a combination of the fact that they are obviously there with significant morbidities and you know, uh, being in status itself is an increased risk for mortality. And so when you add on further you know, medications that can cause hypotension, can cause significant you know, adverse effects from a systemic standpoint, you're obviously only uh, kind of cumulatively adding to the increased risk for mortality. Uh, so this is just showing in that study that uh, Versed or Midazolam is the most commonly used, usually because it's the most titratable and it's the easiest to get. And then obviously, again, the, the initial thought was the, you know, relative, you know, uh, underlying pathophysiology of GABA as, you know, an underlying mechanism for continuous seizure activity. I think that in the next five years or so, that may change because, you know, as we look more and more at the underlying neuronal uh, injury, you know, uh, response, as well as the underlying cellular changes that occur. NMDA antagonism with like ketamine has become a little bit more popular. Um, you know, propofol in its own right. I know that, you know, we use quite a bit in the ER or, or in the ICUs. Its actual efficacy is not proven. There's only been a couple of retrospective studies that have actually looked at it in refractory status epilepticus. And it is associated obviously with a higher rate of hypotension. Um, it does have some NMDA properties but also acts on GABA. Um, so the more, you know, efficacious is going to be your, you know, barbiturate medications, which we tend to avoid. Um, but again, Versed is usually the most commonly that's used. Excuse me. Go ahead. So I'm going to kind of skip over this, but the, essentially the point is to say that, you know, when you use these medications, they have varying efficacy, but the barbiturate medications such as phenobarb has the highest rate of seizure suppression, but all of them have, you know, a higher risk for adverse events. Phenobarbital itself has a significant amount of adverse events, um, including hypotension. There's an increased risk for gram-negative bacteremia. Uh, you can get significant, you know, ileus um, with it. So a lot of times we have patients on very aggressive bowel regimens. We have had patients that have had significant small bowel obstructions um, in our unit while on uh, phenobarb or pentobarb. I apologize. And then um, also in terms of, you know, propofol, we all obviously are aware of the propofol infusion related syndrome. So the longer you have it on and the higher the dose, obviously the higher the risk to develop uh, PRIS. So in terms of that, there's been a lot of research and you know, investigation into finding something that has less adverse effects, is a little bit more hemodynamically stable and can be somewhat more effective to treat seizures. So within the last 10 years, ketamine has kind of become something of a novel agent to help control seizure activity. Um, you know, most of the studies are more retrospective or meta-analyses. There's not actually any prospective randomized clinical trial that has evaluated ketamine in status yet. Um, but, you know, most of the studies that we have done so far have been, you know, somewhat promising. They show relatively good control in terms of this one that was done in 2013, where 68%, you know, showed, you know, resolution of seizures. Um, you know, there was still obviously uh, quite a bit of mortality, but again, is that because we're, you know, limiting our patients to the sickest in these studies, 
or is it because you know the medication itself is not as effective? And we don't know, but we do know that there is a little bit lower of a risk for adverse events. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so in this study that was done in 2014, what they looked at was the you know retrospective analysis of um, these patients who are in refractory status epilepticus, and essentially you can see almost 57% of them, you know, um, seizures were aborted, and then the actual side effects that were related to it were only 2%. So you know, quite a bit less and quite a bit you know more, uh, or quite about it's as effective as other medications, but definitely with a lower risk for adverse events. So and because of the hemodynamically um, stable nature of ketamine. Um, it's a little bit more, you know, judicious uh, to uh, use at the onset, whether you're intubating and then, you know, initiating a continuous CAG or even in the sense of treating for refractory or super refractory status epilepticus. So this is kind of just an updated treatment algorithm. Um, so on the right, you'll see uh, from a uh, 2018 article that Dr. Borales, you know, who was previously here with us um, and is now at Albany, um, he wrote a paper on refractory and super refractory status. And so you can see there, there's kind of a nice stage three versus stage four um, algorithm to treat. And so, you know, obviously you can use this as you would feel in your own clinical practice. But then on the left, you can see that there's a little bit more of a progressive outline. And again, uh, to just kind of stress this, there's no one right or wrong way. I think a lot of it depends on what your patient's presenting with, what their underlying comorbidities are, and just how, you know, significant... Um, you know, their seizure state is. So we can skip ahead. So to kind of conclude, um, you know, when we talk about status, we talk about seizures that last longer than five minutes, and then obviously establish status after 30 minutes, depending on, you know, whether they're focal or generalized, and they're obviously increased risk for long-term complications or mortality. You know, they obviously can be generalized or focal and can present in either convulsive or non-convulsive status. You know, the underlying pathophysiology is an excitotoxic state with uh, loss of GABA neurons, increase in NMDA, and then also increase in glutamate and uh, substance P. And then because there's this bimodal distribution, the older the patient is and the more underlying risk factors with, you know, previous stroke, ICH, um, they're at a higher risk to develop non-convulsive status and go into some form of refractory or super refractory status, which would increase, you know, the risk of long-term complications and mortality, um, and even in the sense of needing tracheostomy or PEG2 placement. And then the last slide. So the big thing I want everybody to take away is that for us as neurologists, seizures and status are extremely important. They are treated as a medical emergency and they should be seen and managed as such. Earlier treatment is better. And obviously putting them on continuous EEG monitoring to assess and evaluate for further seizure activity um, is somewhat you know, uh, encouraged. Um, treatment itself, you know, we've kind of reviewed. And then if they obviously don't really respond to any form of benzodiazepine or second line agent, then, you know, you should probably consider early initiation for uh, an IV anesthetic agent to treat a refractory seizure state. And then after you've treated the seizure activity, that's when you really can worry about getting your further workup or neuroimaging. Um, you know, obviously when you have the EG leads on, you can't get an MRI of the brain. Um, so I would probably encourage usually we get what we would send them for a head CT, you know, while we're treating them. So that way we at least have a baseline image before we hook them up to EEG, knowing kind of the next 24 to 48 hours, they're not going to be able to get more imaging. And then while you're doing that and treating them, you can obviously do a lumbar puncture, send other, you know, perineal plastic workup from the blood, things like that. But, you know, within the first 30 minutes to an hour, the focus should be more on treatment and worrying about diagnostic workup and evaluation once they are actually controlled from a seizure standpoint. So I really apologize for the uh, delay and just kind of run it over. Um, if you have any questions, please feel, feel free to email me and uh, I'll uh, see the floor now. Thank you, Phil. Um, are you okay if I send out these slides to the fellows and the staff? Please. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Guys, I sent out the CME code, but for anyone that missed it, it's 43 three, two, seven. Um, thank you, Phil. Thank you. I apologize again. Thank you so much. That's okay. Thanks.